Welcome to the Forefront Radio. Welcome to the Forefront Radio. I'm your host, Afia Levi. We're going to get into the discussion here about the continuation of the study of the book of Obadiah, as well as the nation of Eden. So let's get right into it, y'all. Do me a favor, share the room with at least 10 people. If you haven't uh, followed the Forefront Radio, make sure you subscribe. The Forefront Radio is available on YouTube, iHeartRadio, and many other platforms. We teach the history of the diaspora from a afro hebraic perspective. So if you're new, make sure you show some love by tapping the screen and getting the likes up and sharing the room. It was clear. If everyone is able to hear, please place a one in the chat so I know that the audio is working properly. Place a one in the chat. Make sure you are tapping the screen and getting the likes up, y'all. Show some love. Let's tap the screen. Let's get the likes up. Share the room with at least 10 people so that way we can get started with this episode. All right. Uh, there has been plenty of discussion in the Hebrew community about who Esau Edom is. So we're going to get into some history involving them and history involving the Israelites that lived in Rome. So this is the book of Obadiah, which is from Rome to America, from Rome to America. Let's start off with the book of Obadiah, chapter one. Let's start at verse one. It says, and the vision of Obadiah, thus said the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us, let us rise up against her in battle. Do you not see that there are a lot of stories and news articles going out right now about how many of the nations want to start conflict with the United States, and they're not afraid? They are not afraid. Russia is not afraid, folks. Russia is not afraid to go to war with America. So we need to pay attention to these things because this is not happening in uh, uh, the Cold War era. This is not happening in the time of us being asleep. In the age of information, ignorance is a choice, y'all. It's readily open to the general public. Everyone sees this. OK, everyone sees this. So we're reading out of Obadiah that God himself says nations are going to rise up against Edom in battle, in battle. So you see that transpiring today where even on We On News, they they uh, came out saying that Russia was not afraid to give America the business. This was less than three days ago, y'all. Less than three days ago, they said that. Okay. So this guy by the name of Vladimir Putin, he's he doesn't give a damn about Zelensky. He doesn't give a damn about NATO. He doesn't give a damn about the U.S. He will go to war. Okay. Watch this. I got an article from We Are News that's entitled Russian-Ukraine War, Russian Missile Drones Hit Kiev as Putin Punishes Zelensky. Listen close. A massive aerial attack on Kiev. It deployed missiles and drones. They went on to strike Ukraine's capital city. In fact, reports say the attack began around 4 a.m. local time. An industrial area in Kiev was hit. A garage was hit. So was a gas station and a storage unit. The strikes triggered a fire at a warehouse and an industrial complex. were sounded across Ukraine. They lasted several hours. This comes days after Ukraine destroyed a Russian Sukhoi Su-57 and claimed to also destroy two radars of Russian S-300 and S-400 systems in Crimea. Yeah, hear that? So what I was telling you about the fact that these jokers are going to war and they're going to bring that stuff to America is I'm not making this up, y'all. So Russia launched a, ma launched a massive aerial attack on Kiev, right? Days after Ukraine claimed it struck 
uh, Russia's uh, area deep inside Russia, right? And the radars of Russia's S-400 and S-300 in Crimea, how far will the Russian president go in punishing Ukraine? And will NATO be hit next? You see that? So they're already having discussions about going to war with NATO, y'all. They're already having discussions about that. Okay. They're already having discussions. So they're having conversations about being on the brink of World War Three. Listen close. It says NATO at the forefront is aiding Ukraine. Now NATO hints at putting nuclear weapons on standby. Is World War III just around the corner? NATO is in talks to deploy more nuclear weapons, taking them out of storage and placing them on standby. The move comes amid a growing threat from Russia and China, NATO Secretary General said. Watch this. Listen to this quote now. Listen to this quote. I want everybody under the sound of my voice to listen to this quote. It says, quote, this is from NATO Secretary General. I won't go into operational details about how many nuclear warheads should be operational and which should be stored, but we need to consult on these issues. That's exactly what we're doing. NATO's aim is, of course, a world without nuclear weapons, but as long as nuclear weapons exist, we will remain a nuclear alliance because a world where Russia, China, and North Korea have nuclear weapons and NATO does not is more dangerous world. You see how these Eurocentric delusionals think? This is how they think. They want to have military deterrent. So Stolenberg said last week that nuclear weapons were NATO's ultimate security guarantee. Wait a minute. Wait a second. So they said having nukes is the guarantee that they can protect themselves. Y'all, is the Bible a true book? Watch this. Obadiah chapter one, verse one, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. An ambassador is sent amongst the heathen. Arise, 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 meaning wake up. Let us rise up against her in battle, in battle. World War three is right in the Bible, y'all. World War three is right in the Bible. You understand? So when these Christians say no weapon formed against me, some pro shall prosper. They don't even know what the heck they talking about. They don't know what it's referring to. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Let's go to Isaiah chapter three, verse five. It says they come from a far country from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land, the whole land, the whole land. Watch this. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 25. The Lord has opened his armory and have brought forth the weapons of his indignation. For this is the work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. So now, now the Chaldeans we know was Iran, Iraq. So that place still exists. This is talking about spiritually Babylon the Great, which is the United States of America, the daughter of Edom. Here's the proof. Let's go to Psalms chapter 137. Psalms chapter 137. Let's read verse 6. Verse 7, it says, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon. What does the Bible say? O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. Happy shall thou be that rewards thee as thou hast served us. So what does the Bible call the daughter of Edom, a.k.a. Rome, a.k.a. Europe, a.k.a. NATO, a.k.a. America? The daughter of Babylon. The children of Edom are called the daughter of Babylon. So now somebody might ask the question, how in the world did the Edomites that lived right alongside the Phoenicians, the Canaanites and Israelites, how did they get into Europe? Well, there's hidden books of the Bible that talk about this. There are hidden books 
that talk about how the Edomites joined themselves with the Romans. All right, let's go to the book of Jasher chapter 90. Let's start at verse one. It says, at that time in the fifth year, after the children of Israel had passed over Jordan, after the children of Israel had rested from their war with the Canaanites, at that time, great and severe battles arose between Edom and the children of Kittim. So this is going into Edom versus the Roman area. So the, the true Etruscans that lived in Italy, that the, the true Javanese that lived in Macedon, they're fighting against the Edomites. Now, let's find out what happens. It says, between Edom and the children of Kittim, and the children of Kittim fought against Edom. And Abianus, king of Chittim, went forth that year, that is, that is in the 31st year of his reign, and a great force with him of the mighty men of the children of Kittim. And he went to Seir to fight against the children of Esau. And Hadad, the king of Edom, heard of his report, and he went forth to meet him with a mighty people and a strong force and engaged in battle with him in the field of Edom. Show me you folks that a war, a trans, uh, 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 a, a international conflict occurred. Okay. That's, that's how lightly I can put it. Verse four, and the hand of Kittim prevailed over the children of Esau and the children of Kittim slew the children of Esau two and 20,000 and all the children of Esau fled from before them. And the children of Kittim pursued them and they reached Hadad, king of Edom, who was running before them. And they caught him alive and brought him to Abianus, king of Kittim. And Abianus ordered him to be unalived. And, and Hadad, king of Edom, was unalived in the 48th year of his reign. And the children of Kittim continued their pursuit of Edom, and they smote them with a great slaughter. And Edom became subject to the children of Kittim. And the children of Kittim ruled over Edom, and Edom became under the hand of the children of Kittim, and became one kingdom, one kingdom from that day, showing you that the Edomites that lived in Palestine now united as the Greco-Roman Empire, okay? This is a portion of history that we are not taught in education systems, Okay, this is a portion of history that we are not taught in education systems. Okay, we're having issues. I'm going to invite you all to come up as a guest, sit in the audience for me in the, in the panel, so that way we can keep the uh, internet active here. Put a one in the chat if the audio is working good. Put a one in the chat if the audio is working good. I need somebody to, uh, I need one of our moderators to come up and sit in the panel so that way this internet isn't glitching and taking me offline with the buffering and all of that stuff. So I'm going to send one of the moderators an invite, sit in the audience for me. I mean, sit in the uh, panel for me. All right. So everybody can hear. I got one from Zakaya. All praises. All praise. I got one from old OJ the Juice. All right. All praises. All right. So we're reading here that the children of Edom and Kittim, meaning Rome. Thank you, SJ, for the one combined together. So now we're going to go into the history of the Israelites living in the Roman Empire. Uh, according to Wikipedia, you have an article by that talks about the history of the Israelites in Ro the Roman Empire. So we're going to touch on that briefly. We're jumping down to the Hebrews in Rome. It says, Rome's involvement in the Eastern Mediterranean dated from 63 BCE. Following the third, the end of the third Mithradic War, when Rome made Syria a province after the defeat of Mithradates the sixth of Pontius. This is going into the history right before Christ came on the scene, okay? So before Christ came on the scene, something took place where the Idumean Edomite Greco Roman Empire took over the region of Northeast Africa, okay? This is history. This is like black history they don't talk about in school. 
Okay, so I, I want to read this information and make it palatable for people that are interested in this content because this is new information that's going to assist you in understanding the dynamic of today, of how we went from living in Northeast Africa to reigning in Rome to then being exiled out of the Roman Empire of Europe, going into West Africa, then having our ancestors taken off the shores of West Africa, brought to the Americas. This is the string of events that is taking place from the BC era to the time of Christ, to the time of the Renaissance, to the time of the transatlantic slave trade. So follow along with me. Rome's involvement in the Eastern Mediterranean dated 63 BCE. Okay, so we read that. It says, the former king, Hyrcanus, who was a black man, was confirmed as the ethnarch, meaning ethnically in charge of the Hebrews by Julius Caesar, 48 BC. In 37 BC, the Herodian kingdom, now this is Edomites now, was established as a Roman client kingdom. So now when it says Roman client kingdom, what do you think that means? When it says Roman client kingdom, what do you think that means, y'all? What do you mean? What do you think that means when it says a Roman client kingdom? It starts with the letter P. It starts with the letter P. What do you think it means when it says a Roman client kingdom? All right, I'll give you the answer. That means a puppet government. That means a puppet government was established by the Romans, just like America does today. America will have a government of puppets where they rule over a nation, state, and territory, and they convince the people that it's in their best interest to have a governor that they want to rule over that territory. The same thing happened with Rome. Who Rome accepted, they would put in the power. Who Rome didn't accept, they would call them various names, okay? The, the perfect example is Omar Gaddafi, right? Haddam, uh, 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 Saddam Hussein. Right. These were all puppets installed by by the European powers. OK, let's continue. It says the Herodian kingdom was established as a Roman client's kingdom, a.k.a. Pep puppet kingdom. And in 6 CE or 6 AD, parts became a province of the Roman Empire named Judea province. So imagine you're living in Africa, a bunch of Romans take over your territory and rename it Judea province, okay? That's the same thing with colonization. When Europe came down to Africa, they renamed various places after titles that was comfortable for them. In the Greek cities in the, eastern, in the east of the Roman Empire, tensions often arose between the Greek and Hebrew populations. Writing around 90 AD, the Hebrew author Josephus cited decrees by Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony, Augustus, and Claudius endowing Hebrew communities with a number of rights, okay? Central privileges included the right to be exempted from Polish religious rituals and the permission to follow ancestral laws, customs, and religion, meaning the children of Israel, right, when we were living in our area and the Romans tried to occupy us, we would not agree with them. Why? Because there was a history of the Maccabees where our ancestors were fighting against, against Greco-Roman assimilation. The wars and battles were so horrific that Rome finally said, you know what? We give up. We, we, we're just going to have an alliance with you guys. We're not going to go to war with you anymore. In order to create peace, Let's go ahead and try to find a way to resolve these issues. You can still keep your laws. You can still keep your customs, but let us be rulers over you, right? So the proof of that is in the book of First Maccabees. So let's get that history briefly. Let's go to First Maccabees chapter one. Let's start at verse one. It says, First Maccabees chapter one, verse one. And it happened after that Alexander, son of Philip, Philip the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Kittim, remember we read about Kittim earlier and how Esau and Edom mixed with Kittim, right? So the Macedonians here are Edomites. The Macedonians here are Edomites, okay? So Alexander the Greek, the son of Philip of Macedon, he was an Amalekite. He was an Edomite, okay? It says, and it happened after Alexander, son of Philip the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Kittim, had smitten Darius, kings of the Medes and the Persians, 
that he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. So my, somebody might ask the question, how do you know forefront that the Edomites and the Greeks came as one empire? Watch this. Let's go to Joel. The Bible answers it's, itself. If you just put the clues together, Joel chapter three, we're going to start at verse six. It says, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold to the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. So we just read in first Maccabees that Alexander was the first over the Grecians, the Greeks, right? So now Greece is the geographical location. Who is the bloodline forefather of these people groups? Let's find out. Let's go to Amos chapter one, Amos chapter one. We're going to read verse nine. It says, thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Tyrus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, to Edom, to Edom. So the children of Israel that were sold as slaves to the Grecians, here we're finding out that Tyre and Zidon sold them to the Edomites. You see that? So in one text of scripture, it refers to them as the Greeks. In another text of scripture, it refers to them as Edom. Does everybody understand that? Put a one in the chat if you understand. I don't want anybody to be confused with this information because you got some people that want to misinterpret scriptures to say that the Edomites are not the same kingdom as the Greeks. Right here, we read in Jasher how they became one kingdom, and we're reading in Joel how they were called Grecians, that's geographical location, and in Amos chapter 1, the whole captivity was given to Edom. So now, let's go to 1 Maccabees once again, 1 Maccabees once again, chapter 3, verse 41, it says, and the merchants of the country, hearing the fame of them, took silver and gold very much with servants and came into the camp to buy the children of Israel for slaves, for slaves. A power also of Syria and of the land of the Philistines joined themselves unto them, joined themselves unto them. So under the Grecian Empire, under the Idumean Empire, the children of Israel, the whole captivity was given to the children of Edom. Let's go back. Amos chapter one. Verse nine, Amos chapter one, verse nine, it says, thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Tyrus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, to Edom, to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. You see that? Who was Edom? Let's go back. Joel, Joel chapter three. Let's start at verse four now. It says, and yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon? So Tyre, Zidon, these are the Tyrians, also known as Tyrus, that we just read in, Shalom, so you hope you're doing well. Just like Tyrus that we just read in Amos, okay? These are the Canaanite tribes. Then it says, all the coast of Palestine. That's going into the Palestinians, right? So who had a part in the captivity of so-called blacks in Africa? It says, oh, Tyre and Zidon. Those are Canaanites and all the coast of Palestine. That's going into the Arabians. Then it says, will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I recompense this upon your own head? Verse five, because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly and pleasant things, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem, have you sold, have you sold, have you sold to the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border? So when Joel chapter three refers to them as the Grecians in Amos chapter one, Tyre and Zidon gave the whole Whole captivity to Edom. You see? So let's go back. Amos chapter 1, verse 9. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, Tyrus is Tyree, just like we read in Joel. And for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because, so God gives you a reason why he's not turning away the punishment from these nations. Because, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, to Edom, to Edom. So Greece is the geographical location. Edom is the bloodline. Once again, the children of Kittim, the children of Macedon, they intermingled with the children of Edom. Let's go back. Let's go to Jasher. Jasher chapter 90. Jasher chapter 90. Let's, let's read verse 1 down to verse 12 again. It says, 
At that time in the fifth year, after the children of Israel had passed over Jordan, after the children of Israel had passed over Jordan, this is going all the way as far back. Shalom to you. Hope you're doing well. This is going all the way as far back as the time of Moses and the Israelites going into the promised land. That's how far this history goes. It says, and rested from their wars with the Canaanites. At that time, great and severe battles arose between Edom and the children of Kittim. So you have the children of Edom and the children of Kittim, separate groups fighting against each other. Then it says, and the children of Kittim fought against Edom. Watch this. And Abianus king of Kittim went forth that year, that is in the 31st year of his reign, and a great force with him of the mighty men of the children of Kittim, and he went to Seir to fight against the children of Esau. And Hadad, the king of Edom, heard of his report, and he made and he went forth to meet him with a heavy people and a strong force, and engaged in battle with him in the field of Edom. Edom. And the hand of Kittim prevailed over the children of Esau, and the children of Kittim slew of the children of Esau two and twenty thousand men, and all the children of Esau fled from before them. And the children of Kittim pursued them, and they reached Hadad, king of Edom, who had uh, run. I'm sorry, who was running before them, and they caught him alive and brought him to Abianus, king of Kittim, and. Abianus ordered him to be slain and Hadad, king of Edom, unalived in the 48th year of his reign. Now watch this. And the children of Kittim and the children of Kittim continued their pursuit of Edom and they smote them with a great slaughter. And Edom became subject to the children of Kittim. Watch this, verse eight. And the children of Kittim ruled over Edom and Edom became under the hand of the children children of Kittim and became one kingdom, one kingdom, one kingdom from that day. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the start of the Greco-Roman Empire all the way down since the time of, of Joshua. Those are the beginning stages of it. Parts of the Edomites stayed in their region. Parts of their Edomites got absorbed into Kittim, aka Rome. This is how we know that the last ruling empire to rule over us today is the kingdom of Rome slash Edom. Let's, here's the proof. Let's go to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel chapter seven. Let's go to Daniel chapter seven. Let's go to Daniel chapter seven. And let's start at verse 12. It says, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season. I saw in the night visions and beheld the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and, and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. So this is the Messiah being spoke about in the Old Testament during the Roman, the Roman Idumean Empire. OK, it says 14 and there was given him dominion and glory. So guess what? This right now now is future prophecy that we're reading what's going to happen at the closing of the Roman Idumean. Dumian Empire. Okay, so we saw Christ being resurrected in the book of Acts chapter one, being lifted up in the clouds and brought to the ancient of days. So now verse 14 is a period of time between that time of him being resurrected up until the second coming when he's given the throne, given the kingdom and comes back to the earth. Okay, from there, let's read verse 14. It says, it says, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Watch this. Let's jump down to verse 17. It says, these great beasts, which are four, are for kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Meaning Daniel had a vision and in his vision, he saw four ruling Gentilic empires. The first empire was Babylon. The first empire was Babylon. The second empire was Persia. The next empire was Greece. The last empire he saw was Rome, was Rome, was Rome. So now let's read about the Roman empire and find out attributes of the Roman empire. Daniel chapter seven, verse 18, but the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever 
And then I would know the truth. Listen close. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, the fourth beast, the fourth beast. Okay. Verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom upon earth. So we know based on history that subsequent empires came after Babylon. Number one, Babylon. That's number one. Number two, Persia. Number three, the Grecian empire. Number four, the Roman empire. Rome broke up into what we know as the Holy Roman empire, eventually to Europe. And then it extended to different pieces of Euro centric people moving to places all all over the world and having dominion. For example, Britain, France, and Spain moved to the United States, Canada, and Mexico, right? They rule now over the United States. Part of Britain went to Australia and they're ruling over the Pacific Island region, right? Parts of these people groups have dominion over Argentina and Brazil. So the Bible is a true book when it says that this kingdom, the fourth beast, that's going to be upon the earth is going to be diverse from all the all the other kingdoms that are on the earth. Watch this. Daniel chapter seven, verse 23. Thus, he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse, meaning different from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Meaning what? Colonization, neo-colonization, Hellenization, assimilation, assimilation integration of Greco-Roman culture embedded in every aspect all over the planet. That's what we're reading here in the Bible. So now, what was the symbol of this particular animal, this beast? You find out about it in 2 Ezra chapter 12. 2 Ezra chapter 12 is where Ezra, one of our forefathers of the tribe of Levi, who was a priest, gives an elaboration of what Daniel saw. So let's go to that real quick. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 12. Let's read verse 10. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, it says, and he said unto me, this is the interpretation of the vision, the vision, the eagle, the eagle whom thou sawest come up from the sea is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of thy brother Daniel, but it was not expounded unto him. Therefore now, therefore now I declare it unto thee. What was the symbol of Rome, America and Greece? and Spain, the eagle, the eagle, the eagle, the eagle, the eagle. When they allegedly went into the moon, they said, the eagle has landed. The eagle has one small step for man, right? Y'all remember that quote? One small step for man, the eagle has landed. What is the symbol on the United States dollar bill? What is that bird? What is that emblem? The eagle. What was the symbol of ancient Rome? The eagle. So now, is the eagle symbolized as Rome? Yes. Is the eagle symbolized as America? Yes. So now the next question is, is the eagle represented as Edom or the Edomites? The answer also is yes. From there, let's go to Obadiah. Obadiah chapter one, let's start at verse one again. It says, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. An ambassador is sent amongst the heathen. Arise and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small amongst the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. So wait a minute. Esau is called the heathen right here. Verse three, the pride, the pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou that dwells in the clefts of the rocks, meaning what? A nation state that had his foundation as Neanderthals in the caves in the clefts of the rocks. Then it says, whose habitation is high, who said in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Meaning what? The nation states of Edom started off in the Caucasus mountains of Georgia, Russia. Then they transitioned their empire all over the world. While they did that, they set up skyscrapers and had high habitation, skyscrapers in New York, skyscrapers in Tokyo, skyscrapers in London, skyscrapers in Las Vegas, skyscrapers in 
uh, Los Angeles, skyscrapers in Florida. Everywhere you go, you see Greco-Roman architecture, Idumean architecture, who set their habitations on high to remind them of the caves and the mountains. Let's read on. It says, you said, turn up the volume. Can you hear me better now? Can you hear me better now? Put a one in the chat if you're able to hear me better. Put a one in the chat if you're able to hear. Put a one in the chat if you're able to hear. Everybody able to hear better? All right. I plugged in uh, the microphone closer to my mouth. Everybody able to hear me better? All right. Let's continue. It says, verse four, though thou exalt thyself, referring to the nation state of Edom from Rome to America, it says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, as the eagle, as the eagle. Remember, when you look on the back of your quarter, what symbol, what bird, what emblem is on your quarter? Is it not the eagle? So every nation state that Esau Edom took control over, he was represented as what symbol? The eagle. What is the great seal of the United States? Is it not the eagle? What is the symbols that you see in the United States military in regards to the bird they use? Is it not the eagle? So it says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest amongst the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So now, this is going into a nation state, who number one, Esau, Edom, the Bible says that the pride of their heart has deceived them. So this is going into a nation that is very prideful. This is going into a nation who who previously dwelt in the clefts of the rocks, meaning mountainous regions, okay? Georgia, Russia, Ukraine, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, all these areas that were mountainous, the Caucasoidal Mountains, they lived in those regions. Then it's saying whose habitation is high. They transition from living in the caves and the rocks to now living in skyscrapers, okay? Whose habitation, meaning where you live, is high meaning their architecture went from dwelling amongst the caves to now dwelling in skyscrapers all throughout the world. Then it says, that says in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? In order for someone to say, who's going to bring me down to the ground? That means you have to have military dominance over the earth. So now guess what, ladies and gentlemen, the United States has close to over 1,000 military installations military bases, and black op sites all across the planet, over a thousand, okay? The same with Russia. They may pretend like they're against each other, but they're basically just cousins. They're basically just distant, distant relatives. When you notice majority of the so-called European powers, they all have nuclear capabilities, to taunt to the whole world and say, who will bring me down to the ground? That means you have to have military strength to do that. Verse four, it says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest amongst the stars, meaning what? That's going into what? GPS navigation, that's going into satellite technology. That's going into what? NASA trying to trying to go into the outer exosphere, stratosphere, into those regions. Elon Musk setting up satellites up there, right? If it wasn't the so-called TYT folks, right? Who set up the International Space Station? Who set up NASA? Who set up space travel? In 2017, former President Donald Trump established something called the United States Space Force. You got jokers right now telling you they never went up to space. Why invest trillions of military funding into something that you've never done? Why have an entire new branch of a government apparatus called the Space Force and Space Command and on top of that NASA and on top of that uh, International Space Station and on top of that GPS satellite technology? You have GPS on your phone. You can navigate from one place to the other, but you got jokers right now saying, oh, there wasn't no moon landing. Okay, if you say there's no moon landing, explain GPS technology. Explain to me satellite technology. Explain to me an inter international space station. They can't. All of a sudden, they're like, up, 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 I don't, up, up, up. 
They can't. So now what we're reading here out of the Bible, we can prove with history and current events. So what was the symbol that Ezra said about the fourth beast? What was that animal symbolized as? Write it in the chat. We got 70 plus people in the chat. There's no reason that our like should be not at 10K by now. So make sure if you're enjoying this live stream that you hit the like button, tap the screen. Let's get the likes up to at least, at least 10K. Okay. So the question is, the question is, the question is, if Ezra, correct, there you go, the eagle, the eagle, the eagle, the eagle, the eagle, okay? That's what it is, the eagle. Is there is there any scripture that calls Edomites or Esau's devils? Yes, let's go to, let's go to, watch this. Let's go to, let's go to Psalm chapter 137. Psalm chapter 137. Here it is, Psalm chapter 137. Let's read verse seven. It says, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, what does the Bible say? O daughter of Babylon, what does the Bible say? O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. So wait a minute. There's a book in, Revela in, in Revelation that talks about Babylon the Great. Make America great again. They're literally telling you, make Babylon the Great again. So let's go to it. Let's go to it. Let's go to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter, no, Revelation chapter 17. Let's start at verse five. It says, and upon her name, I'm sorry, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, the mother of harlots and abominations of the the earth. So the Bible says that Babylon the Great, aka Esau, the daughter of Babylon, is the habitation of devils. Here's the proof. Here's the proof. Let's go to Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. It says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the Great, aka Make America Great Again, is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of of devils. You see that? So does the Bible refer to the kingdom of Babylon the Great, aka the kingdom of Esau, as the devil the Bible speaks of? It says it's a habitation of it, meaning the devil lives there. The devil's seat is in America. Think about it, y'all. Really sit and think about it. Who created a TV show? Now I'm going to ask general questions that everyone should be able to answer if they're familiar with pop culture. Who created a TV show in on Netflix called Lucifer. And who is the main character portraying himself as the devil? They literally tell you right to your face. You don't even see it. Is it the Arab? Is it the Chinese? Hmm. Who literally has a TV show called Lucifer and he represent himself as the boasted child of Satan? Correct. Okay, next question. Who founded the Church of Satan? Was it founded in China? Was it founded in Saudi Arabia? Or was it founded in America? Anton LaVey, Luciferianism, all of that is founded here in America. They have a statute in Northeast America where they have a symbol of Baphomet. The United States was established on satanic principles. Many, many, of, many of them will tell you, oh yeah, 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 we know George Washington was a Freemason Luciferian. Yeah, yeah, we know that uh, Albert Pike was a 33 degree Mason and the Masons, their chief deity was Lucifer. Yeah, we know that our ancestors, you know, set up various uh, pentagrams all over the United States and hidden uh, uh, esoteric, they know this, y'all. They know this. Nobody should be confused on this information because you can find it readily online. It's on the internet. You can Google it. This is why I always say in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. Ignorance is a choice. So, so Esau 
in Psalm chapter 137 is called the daughter of Babylon. In Revelation chapter 18, verse se chapter 17 rather, it's called Babylon the Great. In Revelation chapter 18, it's called the habitation of devils. Meaning what? These deities that you worship in America are devils. Think about it, y'all. All the gods of the nations have been incorporated in America. Santa Claus, that's a devil. Halloween, that's the highest exalted religious or, uh, 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 structure in America for worshiping. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. This, this is like saying, tell me you're demonic without telling me you're demonic, right? Come on, y'all. Think about it. Why would you dress up your children? If you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a Hebrew, if you're into God and the Bible, if you're into just, you know, human decency, why would you dress up your child as a vampire that drinks blood? Hello. Why would you dress up your child as a demon? Why would you listen to the, okay, there's people on TikTok. There's a thing on TikTok right now called ASMR, where people are listening to people whisper and chatter over their phones, right? Let me tell you how creepy it is. They'll do that. And then when they wake up in the middle of the night, all of a sudden they see visions of demons over them. Listen, America is the habitation of demons. You worship different demons and you don't even realize it. Let me help you make it make sense. What you call superheroes today, what you call superheroes today were called gods in the past. In ancient Greco-Roman mythology, Zeus, he was the god of lightning, okay? Who in America today on your TV stations, on your movies is the god of lightning? Put it in the chat. Who is the god of Marvel character? I'm giving you clues. Who's the god of lightning right now that you will watch on Marvel? The, it literally says God of lightning, God of thunder. Who is it? Thor. Thank you, Thor. So it was Zeus back then, but today is Thor, a habitation of devils. Y'all understand what we're covering? We're showing you the hidden agenda to teach you to worship other gods instead of the God of the Bible. Okay. I'll give you another example. Let's look at, for example, the flash. The Flash is able to run very, very fast, right? He has a symbol on his helmet that is the symbol of Hermes. Hermes was a Greco-Roman deity. Correct. Hermes was a Greco-Roman deity. Another, another example is Shazam. Shazam is Zeus. Superman. How is Superman able to get his power? Write it in the chat. How is Superman able to get his power? How is Superman able to get his power from the sun? Is it is it not true? From the sun. So do you not in your Christian church worship on Sunday? Sun, day of the sun? Guess what? There's nowhere in the Bible that says to worship on the sun. Ra, sun god, from the ancient Egyptians, Greece, incorporated it into them, Rome incorporated it into them, Europe incorporated it into them, and then America eventually incorporated it as Superman. Wonder Woman. What is Wonder Woman's first name? What is Wonder Woman's first name? Her name is Diana. Her name is Diana. Guess what? When you read the book of Acts, there's a pagan god worshipped known as the queen of heaven that's called Diana. That's called Diana. Showing you that, yes, America is the habitation of idols, a.k.a. the habitation of devils. You can't make this stuff up, y'all. Stuff up, the Bible is a true book. Babylon the Great, a.k.a. Make America Great Again. Do you not have a TV show called American Idol? American Idol. American Idol, I mean, a.k.a. American Devil. Because idols are devils. That's what it is. According to God, according to the God of the Bible, idols are devils. Hello. Hello. I'm helping you make it make sense. That's why when God said he was going to ex expose the Antichrist, here's the proof, here's the proof, here's the proof. Here's the proof 
Here's a proof that devils and idols are interchangeable. Watch this. Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not unalive by these plagues, yet repented not, meaning they did not change of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, devils, devils. Then it says, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. So when you walk around with, with a cross on your neck of gold, that's an idol, that's a devil. When you walk around with an action figure in your hand, giving it to your children, that's an idol. That's a, here, child, why don't you worship Superman? Why don't you worship Spider-Man? Why don't, not the God of the Bible, not the God of the Bible. Why don't you worship this action figure? That's nothing different than the statues that they gave you back then in Greece and Rome. Those are idols. Those are idols. This is for educational purposes only. The same thing with all of these other modern religions. Guess what? I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but modern religion does not match up with the Bible. Read the Bible again very closely, and you'll see that the first commandment says, do not have any other deities before me. No other gods. All these idols are devils. That's what the Bible says. So if Allah cannot be found in the Bible, and people are marching around a rock, wood and stone, bowing down before the rock, which cannot hear, nor see, nor touch, that means it's an idol. If people are going to Jerusalem and humping the wailing wall, that means that wall that they worship and pray to, that's an idol. If you walk into your Christian Catholic an Anglican Episcopalian church, and there's a statue in there or a picture on the projection screen, and this picture can't talk to you. That is an idol. That is an idol. If you, okay, if you go to the movie theaters, you pay your tithe money, right? You, you put on the collection plate, I want to pay $20 to watch Superman. And they're putting heroic acts of a man that can fly in the air like a god and you're like whoa superman whoa superman oh, superman come save me too that is a idol so when the bible says that babylon the great would be a habitation of devils you think he was making it up god forewarns you in the bible that what would be associated with idolatry is all manner of evil on the earth. This is why we're going into this study about Obadiah, because the man of sin, according to the Bible, is Esau Edom, a.k.a. the children of Rome. Rome is what brought you the gladiator events. Rome is what brought you the stadiums that you have today called football stadiums, right? Basketball stadiums. Olympic Games. During the Olympic Games, who were they worshiping? Zeus Olympus. Hello. Every aspect of your society is pagan. Every aspect of your society that you live in is pagan. Let alone Jesus Christ isn't even European. On top of that. So let's go back. Let's go to Obadiah once again. So the same thing that happened in ancient Rome with the children of Israel being scattered throughout it is the same thing we see here as we read the book of Obadiah and discover certain secrets that was hidden for the ages. Obadiah chapter one, verse four, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle and though thou set thy nest amongst the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Meaning what? Christ is going to come on the scene while these nations are setting up International conflict, international conflict, aka World War III, is in the beginning stages today. It's going to transition from war, war in physical locations to wars in the heavens, meaning fighter pilots, stealth bombers, 
Okay. It's not, we live in a society where technology has advanced so far that they're going to continue their conflict even up into the heavenly realms. Okay. This is why it's very important to understand these prophecies where God says, though thy set thy nest amongst the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Meaning what? They're up in space, the outer exosphere setting up satellites, setting up international space stations, setting up access to having moon moon bases. They're talking about World War III. And Elon Musk, he's like, we got to get out of here because the way things are looking, we, we're going to have to set up something in Mars because I don't see Earth lasting another 50 to 100 years. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. So God himself says, though you set your nest amongst the stars, there will I bring you down. So now, here's the proof of that. Here's the proof of that. Let's go real quick to an article about the Space Force. Let's go into an article about the Space Force. Is the Space Force a real thing? Is the Space Force a real thing? Let's go to, real quick, the United States Space Force. Watch this. It says... The United States Space Force is a space service branch of the United States Armed Forces, along with the Air Force. It is part of the Department of the Air Force, led by the Secretary of the Air Force. You see? Then it says, at its creation, 16,000 military and civilian personnel assigned to the Space Force. As of January 2023, the service consists of 4,286 enlisted service members and 4,314 officers. According to the Air Force Time, making it the smallest branch of the United States military. So now, what news happened recently that you see going on that people are discussing right now. What what news did you hear in regards to the military that's going on right now? Yes, Trump did sign an executive order to create the Space Force. Okay, so now watch this. New York Times. This is today. This is today. This article is today. Let me just play the audio because people think I'm making it up because I'm reading from the New York Times. Let me just play the audio directly from the New York Times. Listen close. Amid military recruitment challenges, Congress debates changes to the draft. This article is by Robert Jimison and read by an automated voice. The United States military has not activated a draft in more than 50 years, but Congress is weighing proposals to update mandatory conscription, including by expanding it to women for the first time and automatically registering those eligible to be called up. So America right now is starting to set up a draft because they're having military recruitment challenges. Take a moment to consider that. Let that sink in for a moment. If we are not at the brink of WW3, why is the greatest military on the planet, the United States, starting to recruit people? Hello. Hello. The proposals making their way through the House and Senate stand a slim chance of becoming law, and none would reinstate the draft compelling service right away. But the debate over potential changes reflects how lawmakers are rethinking the draft at a time when readiness issues have risen to the fore and as the Pentagon is facing recruitment challenges amid a raft of risks and conflicts around the world. The House last week passed an annual defense policy bill that, along with authorizing $895 billion in military spending, including for a 19.5% pay raise for troops, contained a bipartisan proposal that would make registering for the draft automatic. And exp so they register you for the draft automatic. They slipped in a bill through the House to automatically enlist you in there. What if you don't want to fight? What if you have a disability? What if you have children you need to take care of? 
What if you have a remote job that requires you to be there all the time? What if you have investments overseas? What if you have family that needs you? It doesn't matter to them. They will still recruit you. This is an automatic draft, y'all. Do you know what the word automatic means? Mandatory. Mand. Hello. If they aren't preparing for battle, why are they setting up a mandatory, a mandatory dra draft? Automatic. Listen close. Expand the maximum age from 25 to 26 years old. At the same time, a Senate committee last week approved a version of the Pentagon policy bill that would expand the registration requirement to women. Senator Jack Reed, Democrat of Rhode Island and the chairman of the panel, has championed the draft parity proposal. Current law requires most men between the ages of 18 and 25 to register with the Selective Service, the agency that maintains a database of information about those who might be subject to military conscription, commonly referred to as a draft. The program is aimed at allowing military officials to determine who is eligible as a conscript in the event that Congress and the President activate the draft. Which So this is showing you that with all the talks in NATO preparing their citizens for conflict and the United States also preparing for conflict due to the shortage of recruitment challenges they have in their military arm. They're deciding to pass an underhanded bill to recruit United States citizens, including women, including women to fight their fight. I want you to put your critical thinking hats on. When a vast majority of United States citizens are opposed to conflict and war, why would the United States then pass a law to say, let's invite your students, let's invite your people to go to conflict even though they don't want to? Showing you that the things that we're right, reading about in the Bible is true. In order to bolster the ranks of the Space Force and the Air Force, they have to recruit. They have to. In order to maintain their dominance in space, they're going to have to create war. So now, does the Bible predict that this is the system of Esau? This is how Esau operates. Does Esau in the Bible operate out of war? Let's find out. Let's go to Genesis chapter 27. Let's go to Genesis chapter 27 and let's read the blessing of Esau. The blessing of Esau. Let's go to Genesis chapter 27. We're going to start at verse. We're going to start at verse 37. It says, and Isaac answered and said unto Esau, behold, I have made him referring to Jacob, thy Lord and all his brethren have I given to him for servants and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? So here is a conversation between Isaac, our ancestor with Esau, our brother. Esau says this, and Esau said unto his father, has thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, meaning every place that the Edomite Romans go, they're going to live in the best places of society, the best places of society. Go to the beaches, all the beaches got Edomites there. Go to the Caribbean islands and all the resorts, all the Edomites got power over there. Go to the various hotels in various places all over the globe. All the Edomites got power there. You understand what the Bible is saying? It says your dwelling is going to be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above, meaning access to agricultural crops. The dew of heaven is going into rain, right? So they're going to access and steal all the natural resources of the world. Verse 40, meaning a stock market made of grains, corn, sugar, uh, uh, sugar comes from trees, sugar cane. You understand? Then it says, verse 40, and by thy sword, and by thy sword shall thou live. Meaning what? 
military superior technology. Who created the atom bomb? Esau Edom. Who created the hydrogen bomb? Esau Edom. Who created airplanes? Esau Edom. Who had the bright idea to attach pew pews on military flights during World War II? Esau Edom. Who had the power to drop significant pow, pow, explosion stuff from their military? Listen, if, you, if you're not understanding this, who is making video games about modern warfare and psychologically brainwashing your excuse me, your young men and women to enjoy war. Where am I reading from? I'm reading out of Genesis chapter 27, attributes about Esau Edom in the Bible. Genesis 27, we're reading verse 38, I believe it was. No, 30, sorry, verse 40. It says, and by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion, thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. So Esau, who is the so-called TYT folks, they have war plans on the horizon to draft people into their conflict. This is the proof out of the Bible that Esau is the last ruling empire prior to the second coming of Christ. Let's go to 2 Ezra chapter 6 and verse 9. 2 Ezra chapter 6 verse 9. It says, for Esau is the end of the world. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. Let's go from there. Let's go to Obadiah. Let's go to Obadiah chapter 1, verse 21. It says, And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So what do we just find out? Esau is the end of the world. That saviors are going to be developed on from the Israelites, given immortal body, immortal bodies. They're going to judge the kingdom of Esau. And after this empire, the Roman Empire comes to a close. The next kingdom is the kingdom of the Lord. That's what the Bible says, meaning China is not going to rise up as the next superpower. Russia is not going to rise up as the next superpower. The next superpower is the kingdom of Christ. Let's touch briefly. Let's go back to the past now and let's look at the past to see what happened in the past. And let's make parallels to uh, world history and, and events. We're going to read about the Hebrew Roman Wars. Listen close. In 66 AD, the first Roman Jewish war began. The revolt was put down by future Roman empires, Vespasian and Titus, in the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Romans destroyed much of the temple in Jerusalem and, according to some accounts, plundered artifacts from the temple, such as the menorah. So now listen close. Our ancestors... Our ancestors fought against the Romans. The ancient Israelites were melanated people groups living in Northeast Africa. Please tap the screen. Let's get the likes up. There's no reason for us going over this history and information that National Geographic will not expose, that CNN will not talk about. There's no reason we can't have at least, at least 15K. So when you read the accounts, for example, in a book known as From Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf R. Windsor, they state that millions of black Hebrews fled 70 AD and fled into Africa. The Roman slave markets were full of black Israelite slaves. So the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD led to a dispersal both in Europe, where black people lived in Europe, as well as in Africa. This diaspora led to eventually later on the Dark Ages, where they got the upper hand as the Moors and ruled over Europe from 700 AD all the way to about the 1400s. The 1400s brings about the Renaissance when the Greco-Roman people groups came back into power. Rome 
under the Roman Catholic Church started to exile the black people out of Europe. Okay. You read about that when it talks about the expulsion of the Hebrews out of Europe. Okay. Will this be on YouTube after it's discussed? Yes, it will be on YouTube, Lord's willing. Okay. So let's touch briefly on some of the wars that happened in the past. It says, Hebrews continued to live in their land in significant numbers. The Kaidos War was, was 115 to 117 notwithstanding until Julius Severus ravaged Judea while putting down the Bar Koba revolt. Villages were destroyed and most of the Hebrew population of central Judea was almost wiped out, unalived, and sold into slavery, sold into slavery or forced to flee. So now, ask a European, an Eastern European that converted to, to uh, uh, Judaism, ask them, have your ancestors ever went into slavery in all nations like we're reading about? They will flat out tell you no. They will flat out tell you, hell no, we were never slaves. What are you talking about? So this t shows you folks, this is talking about black folks. This is talking about melanated people groups here. So the Romans fought against the Hebrews. The Hebrews became prisoners of war. Many of them were forced to flee into Africa. Many of them were taken into Europe to work as enslaved persons. This is history that they won't talk about, y'all. This is history. It's right on the internet, but they won't reveal it to you. A Hebrew diaspora existed for several centuries before the fall of the Second Temple, and their dwelling in other countries, for the most part, was not a result of compulsory dislocation. Before the middle of the first century CE, in addition to Judea, Syria, Babylon, there was large Hebrew communities that existed in the Roman provinces of Egypt, Crete, and Cyrenica. That's coming into what? Northeast Africa. Egypt is in Africa. Libya is in Africa. Cyrenica, that's Libya and in Rome itself. After the siege of Jerusalem, 63 BCE, when the Hasmonean kingdom became a protectorate of Rome, emigration intensified. Many Hebrews became citizens of other parts of the Roman Empire. Josephus, the book of Acts in the New Testament, as well as the Pauline writings make frequent mention of large populations of Hellenized Jews, aka Greeks, the people that were called Greeks are Hellenized Jews of a diaspora that dwelt in the Roman Empire. Okay, they lived in Roman cities in the Roman world. So Josephus wrote, writes about this. The book of Acts mentions this. And there's various other historical sources that mention this as well. So now, the widespread popular belief that there was a sudden expulsion of Jews from Syria and the, the uh, Syrian area is crucial to understand the displacement and diaspora of the people. It was black people that were expelled out of that region and fled into Africa. You see, the primary religion in Africa prior to prior to Christianity and Islam was Judaism. You read in the book from Babylon to Timbuktu about the various Hebrew kingdoms in Ganata, Hebrew kingdoms in Aksum. There's a people, there's a people right now in Ethiopia called Beta Israel, who to this day still celebrate Afro-Hebraic customs. In Nigeria, the Igbos, as far south as South Africa. So when I hear my Israelite brothers and sisters in America say, oh, don't worry about Africa. Those are just Hamites. None of you have gone to Africa. None of you have hopped in a plane and gone to Africa to make these foolish statements. If you don't know history of your own people, it's best for you to just take notes. Use good sense. Just like America is a melting pot, there's various people groups in Africa, including Shemites, including Shemites. So the diaspora of our people started in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. 
After that transpired, our people were scattered into Africa and Europe and Asia as slaves. As slaves. It's very important to know this information. It's very important to know this information. So this dispersal, I'm going to touch briefly on the dispersal, and let's make the parallels. So we were living in Northeast Africa. We got dispersed into parts of Europe and parts of Africa. Okay? Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa, East Africa. There are people in some of these places that I'm about to name. Senegal, Guinea, Morocco, Egypt, Libya, Ghana, Nigeria, Dahomey, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, uh, 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 Zambia, South Africa, who have Afro-Hebraic customs. Guess what? You probably didn't know this, but the largest place that practices circumcision is the continent of Africa. Circumcision is a Hebrew custom. When you read in the book of Numbers chapter five, there's a vow that a woman takes. Shalom, hope you're doing well. There's a vow that a woman takes that if she is cheating on her spouse, the priest makes her drink a special fluid and that fluid causes her belly to swell. Guess what? That custom is still done in Africa. Moses established refuge cities where a person accidentally committed manslaughter. Guess what? He could flee into another city and dwell there. Guess what? That custom is still going on in Africa. When you read the book of Leviticus, chapter 12 and chapter 15, there are various laws related to when a woman is unclean, dealing with childbirth, as well as dealing with her cycle, in that act, the woman is separated from her husband for a period of time. Guess what? That same tradition is still going on in Africa till this day. So don't be foolish to say, oh, those people over there, they're Canaanites, they're Hamites, when they're doing your religion better than you. They, you, you found out you're a Hebrew maybe a year, two years, three years, five years, maybe 10 years if that, but already in the continent of Africa, you have Israelite customs, but many of them have been deceived, just like we've been deceived by colonization, by slavery and oppression. From there, let's go to Obadiah chapter one, verse five. It says, if thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how are thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers came to thee, would they not have leave some grapes going into what? When you compare Esau, Edom, the Bible says, the Bible says God compares Esau, Edom to thieves. So now let's look at the history of neocolonialism. Let's look at the history of Greece and Rome. Every aspect of their society was not by voting, was not by goodwill towards men. It was by taking, by force, by military armament. So God has given us a metaphor, a, a, a simile for us to think about, to consider. He says, if a regular thief comes, if a robber comes at night, they're going to just take until they have enough. But oh, not Esau, Edom, not the children of Rome. The children of Rome, they will steal a territory. They will kick out the inhabitants of the land. They will rename themselves after that land and call themselves by that name. Steal a land and say, you're no longer Americans, black people. We're Americans. Steal black lands from Australia and say, you're no longer Australians. We're Australians. You're no longer Pacific Islanders. We're Pacific Islanders. You're no longer Africans. Guess what? We'll go down to South Africa and we'll call ourselves Afrikaners. Y'all, a regular thief is going to steal until he has enough. A regular thief is going to steal until he has enough. But the children of Rome, no, they won't. Watch this. If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? Meaning what? A regular grape thief, a regular person that's hungry, that takes just because of his hunger, he's going to take till he's full, but not Esau, Edom. No. Think about the Congo situation right now. 
America right now. Oh, perfect scripture. Let's go to that real quick. Let's go to Proverbs 23, verse 10. Thank you. Perfect precept. Proverbs 23, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 10, and it reads, Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. You see what the Bible says? God says, do not remove the landmark, meaning what? Change lands around, change territory landmarks and say, oh, this area right here, we're going to call it Nigeria. This area right here, we're going to call it Ghana. This area right here, we're no longer going to call it Mali. We're going to call it something else. This area, we're going to call it another region. We're going to call this land Arsereth. Let's change it to America based on Amerigos Vespucci. This area right here that belonged to the native indigenous, let's rename it to Colombia after Christopher Columbus. Let's rename this whole entire region. That's what they did, y'all. That's what they did. What are we reading? The Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Watch this. Let's go to Psalms chapter 49, verse 11. Let's go to Psalms chapter 49, verse 11. It says, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. They call their lands after their own names. Do you not have a place right now called Washington, D.C., based on Washington, who came in as the alleged first president? So now the question for the critical thinker is this. Was Washington the first person to ever set foot in America? No. So why do you have a Washington state? Why do you have a Washington, D.C.? Was Christopher Columbus the first person that discovered America? No. There were already he people here. So how can you rename an entire place Hispaniola, property of Spain? These questions people don't ask in school. And when, and when you ask these questions, they say, how dare you go against our heroes? You get an F. But these are legitimate questions to ask. These are legitimate questions to ask. Okay? So the Bible says their inward thought is that their houses, meaning their, their kingdom, their bloodline, their people, their lineage, their houses shall continue forever. Forever. This is the mindset of the children of Rome. America is the greatest country in the world. It'll never fall. It'll never go down. But every other empire fell. What are you talking about? Every other empire came to an end. We would be delusional if we think this country that many people love so dear would not come into conflict when people are talking about World War III right now. And they're trying to recruit you into a war. They think meaning these government officials, these global elite, the World Economic Forum, right? Your, your United States government, your United Nations, they think that their kingdom is going to last forever, but it's not. They call their lands after their own names. Let's go back. Let's go to Obadiah. Let's go to Obadiah once again, chapter one. Let's read verse five. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? Verse six, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Meaning what? The children of Esau, Edom would not be able to hide themselves in these last days. They've at attempted to. They've integrated themselves into various cultures and called themselves ish. Here's the proof. The suffix ish means sort of like or pertaining to. The, the, the words I-S-H that come at the end of a term, like for example, that shirt is blue-ish, means it's sort of blue, but not really blue. It's almost blue, but it's not truly blue. Pink-ish, that dress is sort of pink, but it's not really pink. Meaning, wherever you go and you find an ish in the building, that means they're not the original. For example, people don't even know that Rome invaded Britain. The original people in Britain were called Grimaldi. They were black. They were Japhetic people. When Rome, Esau, Edom invaded, they called themselves British. British. 
The original Swedes and Danes that lived in the northern regions were black people. When, when the children of Esau, Edom invaded, they started to call themselves Dane-ish, Swede-ish. The original people in Ireland were black people. When, when TYT folks invaded, they called it themselves what? I, Ireland, right? But they called themselves Ire-ish, Ire-ish. So now the Bible says, in Jeremiah chapter 14, verse two, Judah mourneth and the gates thereof languish. They are black. They are black. The word Judah is where we get the ter term juice. Are there a people group today called Jew-ish? We're sort of, you're sort of a Jew, but you're really not. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Uh-oh, wait a minute. They are black. Our Eastern Europeans are Pole-ish people. Are they black just like the soil? Are Ukrainian people black just like the soil of the earth? Black unto the ground? Hello, wait a minute. God says, God says that Esau Edom would not be able to hide himself. Let's go to it. Let's go to Genesis. I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 49. Jeremiah chapter 49. Let's go to the prophecy of Esau Edom. It says, Let's go to the prophecy of Esau Edom. It says, Genesis, uh, Jeremiah chapter 49, let's start at verse 10. It says, but I have made Esau bare, meaning what? Bare bottom. When somebody is bare bottom, that means you can see everything exposed. When someone is bare bottom, that means everything is exposed for everyone to see. It says, I have uncovered his secret places, secret places. Remember we read about how they call their lands after their own names. They secretly invaded a land, wiped out the indigenous population and called themselves by the, those titles, right? It says, I have made Esau bear, meaning exposed. Then it says, I have uncovered his secret places. He shall not, he shall not, he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, meaning what? Esau Edom cannot hide who he is. Italy, Rome, their seed is spoiled. Right now, there are articles in the news where the Romans, aka Italy, that their bloodline and their population numbers are diminishing. That's what the Bible says when it says his seed is spoiled, like spoiled milk. Seed is going into offspring. His seed is spoiled means that his offspring is diminishing, diminishing. You go to Italy, statistically speaking, they're having more people passing away than people that are being born. Same thing with America. Same thing with France. Same thing with Portugal. Same thing with, guess what? Even the same thing with Jamaica. I'm sorry, same thing with Japan. Because people forget that Greece... Rome and Britain invaded China, intermingled with the people. You ever heard of Genghis Khan? A whole lot of war and a whole lot of booty, right? Th those were Edomites that intermingled with it. Why do you think they have a fascination with Tart Tartaria right now on TikTok? It's because they know their relatives. Tartaria is going into the Mongols that intermingled with the Greco-Roman people groups. They know their ancestors, y'all. That's why there's a fascination with Tartaria right now on TikTok, because that's their cousins. That's their wheat and the tears. There you go. So now, does the Bible say they're going to mingle them see, their seed? Yes. Let's go to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel chapter two. Daniel chapter two. Let's go to verse 43. It says, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. Showing you what? The people of Esau Edom wanted to establish a melting pot. The primary objective of, of Greece and Rome was to rule over the planet intermingle their bloodline all throughout the world, okay? The same thing that Europe did, the same thing that America did, 
and we see that they have mingled their seed amongst men. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. And whereas thou hast saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. This is the last ruling empire, the empire of Rome. The empire of Rome is represented in 2nd Esdras as the eagle, the eagle. Let's go back to that again. Let's go back to that again. Let's go to 2nd Esdras, 2nd Esdras chapter 12, verse 10. It says, and he said unto me, this is the interpretation of the vision. The eagle, the eagle, the eagle, whom thou sawest come up from the sea, meaning the beast that arose out of the sea that Daniel saw, is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of thy brother Daniel. But it was not expounded unto him, meaning not revealed unto him. Therefore, now I declare it unto thee. So now, if the kingdom of Rome is represented as the eagle, is the are the children of Esau Edom also represented as the eagle? Let's go back. Obadiah chapter one. Obadiah chapter one, verse four. Let's start at verse one. It says, the, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord concerning Edom. Let's jump down. Chapter in Daniel again, verse please. The What we read in Daniel was Daniel chapter two, Verse 43, where it talked about the mingling their seed with the seed of men. The fourth beast is written about in Daniel chapter seven. When you read Daniel chapter seven, you have a lion, that's Babylon. You have a bear, that's Persia. You have a leopard, that's Greece. But the last fourth empire, which is Rome, there's no description of an animal. Ezra tells you that animal is an eagle. Now, Obadiah is going to reveal that same eagle is called the children of Edom. Okay, I hope you're putting two and two together. Obadiah chapter one, verse one, it says, the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle, showing you the children of Esau, Edom are preparing for World War three. Verse four, verse four, Obadiah chapter one, verse four, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle as the eagle, as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest amongst the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So Esau is going to set up space travel, military technology, GPS satellite systems in the realm. And what is this chapter talking about? The eagle. Now, what is the symbol of America? Write it in the chat. What is the symbol of America? Write it in the chat. Write it in the chat. What is on your quarter? What is on your dollar bill? What is on your great American seal? When you go into a courtroom on top of the flag, is there not an eagle? They're showing you who you are. What scripture was that? Obadiah chapter one, verse one and verse four. That's the scripture we just read. So what do we, what do we find out today? We found out today that the children of Esau Edom tried to hide themselves under different names, British, French, Spanish, U-ish, uh, Yid-ish, Swede-ish, Dane-ish, ish-ish-ish, full of-ish, American-ish, right? <laughs> full of-ish, pertaining to, not the original, carbon copy, GMO, not organic, non-organic. Then we found out that the children of Israel were scattered in both Africa and the Roman Empire as early as uh, 63, AD, 63 BCE, during the time of the Maccabees. We also showed you that the destruction of Northeast Africa, Jerusalem, took place in 70 AD. And many black Jews fled into Africa, and many of them were taken as slaves into Europe. We also went over today the fact that they were dispersed after they were exiled out of Europe into West Africa. And many of them were taken in the 1600s as enslaved persons to the Americas. We also proved today that the children of Esau, Edom, intermingled themselves with the children of Kittim in the book of Jasher, chapter 90. 
So if people say, hey, the children of Esau, they were originally melanated people. Well, they mixed themselves somehow with the seed of men and they're no longer black. If that's your postulation, they're no longer black. They're TYT folks today. They're mixtures that have been watered down. Mixtures of Arabic people, mixtures of European people, mixtures of Chinese people, mixtures of Japanese people that have rulership over the planet today. These people that are in the United Nations, a lot of them are relatives. These people in the World Economic Forum, a lot of them are relatives. Okay, don't 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 sit and think that they're different people and different culture. A lot of them sit on the same seats with the same meetings. Hey, Chuck, how you doing? Let's go to the potluck. They're related to each other. Okay, they are related to each other. I'm telling you, research far enough and you'll begin to see the dots connect. It's too much for TikTok. I'm not going to say it because they're going to start censoring me. So this was part two of our discussion of the book of Obadiah from Rome to America. Questions, comments, concerns. If you have any questions, feel free to hit the guest icon. We're going to bring you up on stage and we can answer questions based on the scriptures. Okay. If you have any questions, comments, if you haven't followed the Forefront Radio on TikTok, please follow this account. Follow us also on iHeartRadio, as well as uh, Spotify and many other platforms. If you have any questions or comments, hit the guest icon. And, and thank you for, for uh, contributing to the uh, live goal. The live goal is let him cook. So if you're able to, please contribute to our live goal. Our live goal is let him cook. I forgot to even pin it. I forgot to pin it today. So if you're able to contribute to our endeavors to teach the diaspora here in Africa, make sure you are able to contribute through this means or through Cash App, whatever is easier for you. Questions, comments, or concerns? Any questions? Uh, great dialogue, precepts, and history brought out edification. All praises to the creator. All praises to the creator. So um, anyone want to come up and give their thoughts on the topic and provide any questions that need to be answered so that way anyone that has a question we can make sure you answer we answer it based on the text we try to do our best to answer things biblically based so if you have a question please come on the floor don't be shy i don't bite unless you say something stupid <laughs> but feel free to uh, come on the platform and ask your question and i will answer it to the best of my ability with scripture okay if you have any questions comments or concerns uh if you learn something new today put a one in the chat make sure you're sharing the room with at least 10 people follow this account the forefront radio which is the forefront media and our backup channel the forefront on tiktok as well as on YouTube and Spotify. All right, I got ones in the building. I got ones in the building. All praises to the Most High. I'm truly uh, grateful for these opportunities to have these insightful discussions with brothers and sisters. Uh, hit the guest icon if you want to share your two cents or have any questions pertaining to the topic. Feel free to hit the guest icon and come up and share your thoughts. I try to keep these lessons short, but I know sometimes we can get uh, very in-depth. I try to uh, give a lot of information and concise it in a way where it's uh, uh, palatable for the people. So if you learn something new, thank you for the ones. Appreciate you all. Appreciate you all. Uh, there were several people that were here earlier. So if you have any questions... You know, we're opening the floor for you to get those questions answered because a lot of people have misconceptions in regards to the Bible. So we try our best to answer it based on scripture. OK, no feelings, just scripture. OK, no feelings, just scripture, no emotions, just scripture. That's all we do. Scripture history. If you notice on my platform. I do scripture, history, scripture, history, because what I want to do is I want to remove religion from the equation. I, I don't want you to look at the Bible only as religion. I want you to look at it as history, because remember, we talked about Alexander the Greek. That's a historical figure. We talked about Cyrus the Greek. Thank you for contributing to the live goal. I appreciate you. We, we talked about Cyrus in a previous discussion. That's history, y'all. We talked about the Romans. We talked about the Greeks. 
We talked about uh, various forms of colonization throughout the world. We talked about exploration of Europe going, going into the Americas. We talked about the captivity of the 12 tribes. We talk about a lot of history, okay? So try to remove religion because a lot of times people talk about the Bible just from a religious perspective, and that's when they start getting emotional and they say, oh, my doctrine is this and my belief is that. I don't care about your beliefs. I care about history and I care about biblical-based facts from a historical perspective, that's what I care about, okay? So what I try to do is I try to remove religion from the equation and ideology because that confuddles the history, okay? When you focus on the history, you'll better understand things without the religious hogwash. Like like people, like my dad called me the other day and he said, did you participate in Holy Communion? And then I asked him, I said, Father, when you read the history about the Last Supper of Jesus Christ, what event took place? And he said, the Passover. Then I asked him a question. Why don't you celebrate Passover then? He was like, well, uh, 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 well uh, uh, you see, you see, you see, you start to stutter, right? You can't answer the question now. All of a sudden you're like, but eep, but eep, but eep, that's all, folks. Now you're running out of the room because your religion won't let you ask important questions. Holy Communion was Passover. That's all it was. So celebrate Passover yearly. You don't got to come every two, three weeks to eat the cookie at the Catholic church and drink some, drink some wine. <laughs> oh man. Listen, and, the, and if you hear all the stories that's been going on with the Catholic priests, you don't need to be drinking any kind of wine around then. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you know, you understand? <laughs> let's have the screen. Let's get the lights up. Let's get the lights up to at least uh, 30K. Let's get the likes up to at least 30K, y'all. We've been sharing a lot of information and I hope it's been insightful for you. Please do me that great favor by showing your love, by tapping the screen. Let's get the likes up. You said, can you explain Isaiah chapter 60 pretending to the ships of Tarshish? All right, come up on the panel. Come up on the panel. Oh, I guess you need a, a, a amount of followers to come up. Okay, let me see. Can you explain the ships of Tarshish? Yes, let's, let's go to... Let's go to that real quick. Let's go to the scripture, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 60, verse nine. Let's go to that real quick. Isaiah chapter 60, verse nine. I'm glad you asked that question. Let's go to the Bible and let's get answers. Isaiah chapter 60, verse nine. And it reads, it says, Surely the isles shall wait for me and ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. So now, just in the same way, the ships of Tarshish, a.k.a. Spain, Europe, sold our ancestors with silver and gold and took them across to the Americas, the reverse is going to take place as well. You read that from, from verse 10 all the way down. But let's go briefly into the history of the ships of Tarshish. From there, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 27, going into the ships. Okay, notice the key factor is the ships. Watch this. Ezekiel chapter 27, let's start at verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Now, thou son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus. Remember, we read about Tyrus in Joel chapter 3. Tyre and Zidon sold the children of Israel as slaves to the Grecians, right? Let's read on. It says, and say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate in the entry of the sea, the entry of the sea. If you're entering into the sea, what do you need to travel across the seas? Do you not need ships? Do you not need ships and boats to travel across the sea? The answer is yes. So now we're going to read about the construction of the ships involving trade. 
trade of persons, trade of goods, trade of gold, silvery, ivory, ebony, all of these things that come from Africa into Europe, across the Mediterranean, all the things that come from Africa to America, across the sea with ships, with ships. Let's read on. It says, it says, and said unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate in the entry of the sea, which art a merchant of the people. So when you say merchant, the word mer means water, mar, water, mar, el mar, water, like a mermaid, mar maid is a water maid. A merchant is a trader that travels across the sea with goods and services. You see? For educational purposes only. Thank you for putting that there. It says, merchant of the people for many isles, meaning what? The isles of the Gentiles going into the isles of the Mediterranean, the isles of Africa, the isles of Asia, the isles of the Pacific Ocean, the isles of the Caribbean islands, right? Many isles, thus saith the Lord God, O Tyrus, thou hast said, I am perfect in beauty. Thy borders are in the midst of the seas, in the midst of the seas, thy builders have perfected thy beauty. Now watch this. It says, they have made all thy shipboards. This is going into the construction of slave ships and cargo ships. That's what we're reading out of the Bible, y'all. It says, they have made all thy shipboards of fir trees of Sinar. Sinar is Shinar, which is Babylon. It says, they have taken cedars from Lebanon to make mast for thee. The term mast is going into what? The mast that you have on a ship. Okay, so the ships of Tarshish are explained right here in this chapter. Watch this, verse six, of the oaks of Bashan, of the oaks of Bashan. What is What are boats made out of? Cedar and oak and fir trees. Of the oaks of Bashan have made thine oars. So God was so specific of knowing each nation state that was responsible for our captivity. He's giving a detailed description of various places where they acquired goods and services for their maritime trade. Let's read on. It says, of the oaks of Bashan, have they made thine oars? The company of the Asherites, that's the Assyrians, have made benches of ivory. Ivory comes from Africa and Asia. Ivory is from elephant tusks. Elephants live in Africa and Asia. Who told you that the Bible has had its roots in Europe? The Bible has its roots in Africa. That's where they were taking all the goods and services from and the people. Let's read on. It says, thy benches of ivory brought out of the Isles of Kittim. So this is going from traveling from the Assyrian Empire all the way to the Roman Empire. Both the Assyrians and the Romans traveled across the Mediterranean with ships, with ships, with ships. Let's read on. Fine linen was broidered work from Egypt. That's in Africa. Was, was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail, sail is a part of a ship, blue and purple from the Isles of Elisha, the islands of Elisha going into what? The area of the Japhites living in the British Isles, living in the Isles of the Gentiles. You understand? Then it says, so this is going into what? What we called the Silk Road slave trade or the Silk Route trade. Okay. Trade going all the way across the oceans from Ireland all the way to Shangdang, China. Okay. This is showing you how illustrious this trade route was. Okay, let's read on. It says, fine linen of, of broidered work of Egypt was thine, which, which thou spreadest forth to be thine sail. Blue and purple from the isles of Elisha was that which covered thee. Let's read on. The inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad, these are Canaanites, were thy mariners. So the, so the Assyrians and the Romans worked back and forth between Egypt, worked back and forth between the Isles of Elisha with the inhabitants of Zidon and Tyre. That's the area of Lebanon. Lebanon, Syria, there were melanated people that they called the Phoenicians back then. 
that were ruling over that ter territory. You're gaining more information? Tap the screen. Let's get the likes up. Okay? I'm going over history and biblical prophecy right here. Okay? So now it says, verse 9, the ancients of Gebal and the wise men thereof were in were in thee thy caulkers. Caulkers are the ones that uh, basically stop the chinks that are in the in the ship. They caulk the ship to make sure the ship doesn't sink. They put an inner lining to, to insulate the ship from water. Okay. It says all the ships, all the ships of the sea with their mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise. So what was some of the merchandise we talked about? What was some of the merchandise we talked about? We talked about ivory. We talked about purple and silk and blue, right? We talked about their merchandise. So let's read on. It says, they of Persia and of Lude and of foot were that were in thine army, thy men, thy men of war. They hang the shield and helmet in thee, they set forth thy comeliness. Verse 11, the men of Arvad with thine army were upon thy walls round about and the, and the Gamad, I'm sorry, and the Gamadims were in thy towers. They hang their shields upon the walls thereof. Now watch this. This is going to be the answer to your question right here. It says, verse 12. We're going to read verse 12 and verse 13. It says, Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches with silver, iron, tin, lead. They traded in their fares. Y'all see that? So what we just read in Isaiah about the ships of Tarshish relates to goods and services and people that are going to be traded in the the conflicts that happen across the world. Now watch this. Javan and Tubal and Meshach, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. So the merchandise that Tarshish had was our sons and our daughters. The merchandise that they had was our sons and our daughters, including what? All kinds of riches, silver and tin and lead, right? So now this fast forwards now to Europe. Europe was responsible for trading in the persons of men. America was responsible. This is why they call it cargo slave ships, meaning originally they were passing out goods like tin, copper, ivory, right? Then they decided, you know what? Let's get some workers too. The workers didn't choose that though. Who were the workers? The Israelites, the Israelites. That's why it's in the Bible. That's why this is in the Bible. The ancient black Hebrews were taken into captivity and were reading about the slave ships, the cargo. The, listen, the same thing that we have today, they, they still do it, but now it's under the tankers now. Those huge tankers that you see across the ocean with those metal boxes, they have your Amazon products in it, your Walmart products in it, cars in it, and sometimes people are in it. Hello. Hello. Same thing back then, same thing today. Tanker coming from China. All of a sudden, you got a whole bunch of Chinese coming in America from off tankers. What's going on here? Same thing we're reading. Whole bunch of black people from Africa being taken from their land, put on trade ships, and brought to the Americas. We're reading it out of the Bible. Let's read it again. Tarshish was thy merchant. Tarshish is going into what? Tarsus, Spain, Spain, Europe, Rome, Italy. Portugal, all those areas in the Roman Empire. From there, let's go, let's go to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 19. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 19. It says, nope, verse 9 again. It says, surely the isle shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish 
the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far. You see that? So initially, the ships of Tarshish were used to afflict the children of Eber, meaning the Europeans were the ones that brought the children of Israel on slave ships. Watch this, watch this. Here's the proof. Let's go to Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24. Even Balaam prophesied about this, about our ancestors and, and the children of Esau, Edom, and all of that. Watch this. Let's go to let's go to Numbers chapter 24. And let's read. Let's read verse 24. It says, and ships and ships. And ships shall come from the coast of Kittim. That's Rome. Remember, Rome intermingled with Esau, Edom. Rome intermingled with the Amalekites, with Zepho, with the children of Esau, Edom. And ships shall come from the coast of Kittim and shall afflict Asher, that's Assyria, and shall afflict Eber. Eber is the Hebrews. And he also shall perish forever. Meaning what? The children of Esau, Rome, Kittim, they're going to be destroyed forever. God is going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to wax them. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68 is going into the slave ships of Europe. The slave ships of Babylon, the slave ships of Egypt, the slave ships of Assyria, the slave ships of America. That's what it's talking about. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 68 is talking about. The real Israelites being sold and enslaved on ships, on ships, on ships and brought to the Americas. Okay, the last slave ship allegedly that came to America was called, I think it was called uh, something with a C. What was it? Was it Caligula? No, that was a Roman Empire emperor. Was it Calig Califa? Califa? No, what was it? It just came to my head and I forgot it that quick. What was the last slave ship that came to Louisiana? It started with a C. Huh, it escapes me at the moment. But I hope I answered your question, uh, brother, that had the question about uh, Isaiah chapter 60. So the reference for Isaiah 60 verse 9 can be found in Ezekiel chapter 27. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 27. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 68 doesn't say anything about water. Okay. Let's go read Deuteronomy 68 verse 28. Let's read because Gentiles like to lie. They want to do a Jedi mind trick and say, hey, because I said so, that doesn't work on me. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and let's read verse 68. It says, and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, with ships, with ships. Where is a ship located? Are ships located on the ground, on the earth, or on the water? Are ships located on Clortilda? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Did that say airships? No. Watch this. Watch this. Here's the precept. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 18. Meaning what? You have to always cross-reference the Bible. You remember when you went to college and your teacher said, show me your sources. You have to use the Bible to cross-reference the Bible. Okay? You can't use your own words. Watch this. This is Isaiah chapter 22, verse 18. It says, he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shall thou be unalived, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. So now, when you were taken into captivity, did you toss and turn on the boats, on the ships, over the waters of the Ethiopic Ocean, aka Atlantis Ocean? The answer is yes. Did people get taken across the ocean under the Indian Ocean slave trade on ships? The answer is yes. Did people get, get taken from the East African slave trade all the way from Africa, Kenya, 
Mozambique, Tanzania, and brought on dows, aka ships, to the regions of Saudi Arabia, India, and China? The answer is yes. What was the mode of transportation? A ship over the water. Not not when the Australians participated in black birding, which had to do with them kidnapping aboriginal people black people and chinese people and indian people and bringing them to australia did they fly did they go on an airship no it was boats boats across the water some some people simple on simple syrup you can't make this stuff up people will lie and get away with it they'll say airships no you are lying you have to cross the water okay hold on how do you get your products from china does china send them on ships did you not set up a Panama Canal in order to make sure you have access all around the Americas from one side, from east to west, so you could travel goods and services across ships, across boats, water, water, okay? Aboriginal means abnormal original, not abort. Abnormal, like ab means without. So ab means without, without origin. That's what it means abnormal it's outside of the normal realm okay google tartarian airships okay tartaria is the area of the mongols the mongols integrated themselves with greco-roman people groups that's how chinese people went from dark skin to yellow to white hello hello could you please put on your critical thinking hat Tartarian airships. Okay, you want me to Google a conspiracy theory? No, thank you. What are we reading? The Bible. I go by the Bible, not conspiracy TikTok theories. Please, can I get can I get not the goofies the goofies on my TikTok live? I keep getting goofies, man. I want I, I like the legitimate questions, like biblical based questions. People are just making statements and don't even know what the heck they're talking about. Okay. Don't even know what the heck they're talking about. California is Israel. You know, at this point, I'm just going to block you. At this point, the stupidity is beyond. I just can't. I just can't. I just can't. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. I just can't. Mute in land. Mute, 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 mute. Let's love one another. Let's treat each other fairly. Let's be kind hearted one to another. But let's not deal with intellectual dishonesty. California is not the land, the promised land. California is full of, have you been to San Francisco? How is that the holy land of God when you got bicycles going all over the place? You got people riding on both sides of the streets. Okay. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. California is the homeland of Sodom and Gomorrah. What are you talking about? San Francisco is not the holy land. Get out of here. Mutant land. Mute, 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 mute. All right, y'all, uh, we're going to end the live if there's nobody else that has insightful dialogue that they want to uh, discuss. We'll go ahead and end the live if there's no other questions, comments or concerns. Hopefully I was able to answer your questions biblically. I apologize for the goofies. Somebody said, yeah, get out. Yeah, get out of what? Get out of America? Get out of America? Is that what you're saying? Abraham, is that what you're saying? Get out of America? Oh, you said not you. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I thank you. You meant the uh you meant the, the the goofy. Thank you. I appreciate everyone that's joined on in that's joined on in this discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I pray that this information was informative for you all and that we can all um enjoy fellowshipping with our family members and friends and sitting down and having insightful discussions. Juneteenth, talk on it. Okay, sure thing. Juneteenth was a holiday made like any other holiday to coddle people into a stupor. It was another holiday created by the government in order to acknowledge that you, two years later after your imprisonment in America was over. You just found out about it. Juneteenth is a celebration that was created two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. 
So now I'm a fan of freedom fighters that fight against oppression. However, however, my celebration is the Passover when God himself set the captives free. My celebration is when in ancient Egypt, when our ancestors were held in bondage, that we were set free completely, completely, meaning we didn't have to turn back and rely on the Egyptians after we were free. You're still in captivity. You're still in, if you're a subject to payments, you're still in captivity. According to Baruch chapter three, verse eight, it talks about, behold, we are yet this day in our captivity for a reproach and a curse and to be subject to payments. Next question. What does it mean? The most he said we were invited to the wedding are those people are those people. What? 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 I'm sorry. I'm trying to understand your question. It says, what does it mean? The most he said we were invited to the wedding. Are those people something? Uh, when is our next show? Tomorrow. Lord's will tomorrow. We don't have any interruptions or any other uh, stuff going on. It'll be tomorrow. Lord's will. So make sure you follow this account. Uh, could you rephrase your question for me? It says, what does it mean? The most he said we were invited to the wedding. I'm trying to understand. The Messiah said you're invited. To oh, OK. Now I understand what you're saying. OK, so. When you read certain apocryphal texts, thank you for contributing to the live goal. When you read certain apocryphal texts, it talks about the kingdom of heaven being prepared for us. OK, so the kingdom of heaven is going into New Jerusalem. OK, that's what that's talking about. When it's talking about the wedding feast, that's talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth being prepared. OK, let's go to the hidden writings that they tried to take out of the Bible to show you what that's talking about, okay? Let's go to 2 Ezra chapter 2 verse 13. It says, "Go ye and go and ye shall receive. Pray for a few days unto unto you that they may be shortened. The kingdom, the kingdom is already prepared for you." Watch, meaning what? The heavenly realm, New Jerusalem has been established for you for you for you let's go to john chapter let's go to john chapter 14 even christ himself said that the kingdom is prepared for you john chapter 14 verse 1 it says let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare i go to prepare a place for you and if i go to prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself that that where i am there you may be also from there let's go to revelation revelation saying the same thing revelation chapter 21 verse 1 it says and i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and i john saw the new jerusalem coming down from heaven prepared as a bride for her husband do you see that all right so uh, explain Genesis chapter 17, verse 20. I hope that answered your question. The wedding feast is going into New Jerusalem. Uh, explain Genesis 17, verse 20. Genesis 17, verse 20. It says, and as for Ishmael, behold, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes, twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. So the twelve princes is going into the rulers of the Ishmaelites, the twelve nations of the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaels are what we call the Arabs today. They were melanated people before they intermingled with Ottoman Turks and Greco-Roman people groups of Syria that invaded Greece, Rome, that, that invaded and intermingled with them. 
Okay. So, so you go back to Genesis chapter 16, that tells you the prophecy concerning Ishmael, that Hagar's son Ishmael would be a wild man. And this wild man would be at, at war with every other man. So chapter, chapter 17, when you go to it, goes into the covenant now that Abraham had with his children. So yes, he did bless Ishmael, but but God's covenant is not with Ishmael, which is where we get Islam from, but it is for Isaac, verse 21. But my covenant, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, with Isaac, meaning Isaac, then Jacob, not Ishmael. All right. It says, can you explain the feast days and new moons to celebrate? Sure. Leviticus chapter 23 gives us, give you the festival days that God gave us. He also gave us general days that we can celebrate, such as the new month. The new month is the full moon. The new month is the full moon. Here's the proof. Let's go real quick to scriptures that talk about the full moon. Whenever you read about the dark moon in the Bible, like darkness, that's going into judgment. Whenever you read about light, that's going into celebration. So, Sirach chapter, Sirach chapter 39, verse 12. Sirach chapter 39, verse 12 says, Yet have I more to say, which I have thought upon, for I am filled as the moon at the full. I am filled as as the moon at the full. So when is the new month celebration? The full moon. Here's another one. Sirach chapter 50, verse six, write this down. Sirach chapter 50, verse six. He was as the morning star in the midst of a cloud and as the moon at the full. That's celebration, y'all. That's, cel that's our new moon. It's during the full moon, during the full moon, during the full moon. That's our new month celebration. Let's go to new moon in the Old Testament. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 5. And David said unto Jonathan, behold, tomorrow is the new moon. I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, showing you that the new month celebration, we sat at dinner and enjoyed ourselves with our family, with our people. You understand? You had a good old barbecue, but it's considered a Sabbath. Uh, April question mark, question mark. What is April question mark? Can you explain that for me, brother Yahabashai? So we also find the new month celebration in Psalms chapter 80, 81, verse 3. It says, blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time of appointed on our solemn feast day. So our festival days is the new month. So now even in the kingdom of heaven, we're going to celebrate the new month celebration. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So now we have other feast days such as Hanukkah, which you could find out in the book of Maccabees. Hanukkah, also known as the Feast of Dedication, Jesus himself celebrated it. Don't let nobody tell you not to celebrate a holiday that Jesus himself celebrated. Okay, let's go. Let's go to John chapter 10, verse 22. If Jesus did it, you can do it too. John chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication, and it was winter. So if you call yourself a follower of Christ, follow what he did. Did Christ celebrate the feast of dedication? The answer is yes. Now, where is the feast of dedication located? First Maccabees chapter four. That's what we call Hanukkah. There was also a celebration called Purim. Purim is found out in the book of Esther. Esther was fighting for our lives. Mordecai ended up getting the rule where the Macedonian Greeks were trying to take us out. Shalom to you. The Macedonian Greeks, the TYT folks, was trying to take us out. And Mordecai and Esther, a black woman and a black man, fought with the Persian king to make sure that we were not unalive. Due to that, we celebrate a holiday called Purim.
That's the holiday where we give gifts to one another. We give gifts to our children and to our family. We don't give gifts on December 25th. We give gifts during Purim. Okay? We give gifts during the festival of Purim. The festival of Purim, you can read about that in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther. Let's read that real quick. The book of Esther, chapter 9, verse 26. Wherefore they call these days Purim after the name Pur. Therefore, for all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them, verse 28, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation after every generation, meaning your, your, your descendants, okay, every province and every city, and that these days of Purim shall not fail among the Hebrews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Meaning you remember when you fought against the Macedonian Greeks, okay? Next question. Can you please repeat the scriptures in Sirach and Psalms? Thank you. Yes. In regards to the new month celebration, aka the new moon, you have Psalms 81, Psalms 81, verse 3. In regards to the full moon in the Apocrypha, in regards to the full moon, you want to read Sirach 39, verse 12. Book is, is the book of Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. Chapter is chapter 39. The verse is verse 12. I apologize if I go fast, y'all. Then you have Sirach chapter 50, verse 6. Sirach chapter 50, verse 6. Here's another one in Sirach. Let's go to Sirach or Ecclesiasticus chapter 43, verse 6 to 8. And I'll read it for you. It says, he made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign and a sign of the world. Let's say you're driving down the street and you need a sign to indicate where you're going. Do you have to look at the sign visibly? Yes or no? Martin Luther King Boulevard, you're driving on the highway. Wouldn't you have to physically see the sign to know what exit ramp to get off? Yes or no? This is so easy. I don't see how Hebrews get it confused where they say, oh, the, the moon has to be dark. No, a sign you have to see. Thank you for the contribution. I appreciate you. Verse seven, from the moon is the sign, the sign of feast, meaning our festival days, not the Sabbath, but our festival days. We see that by the moon. You have the new month, which is the beginning of the month on the full moon. In this month of June, it'll be the 22nd. The 22nd is the full moon of this month. That means we're transitioning now to the next month. So we're transitioning into July right here in, in June 22nd. That's why you start seeing this more of a temperature change. It's going to start getting hotter in the next couple of days. You're going deeper into the summer. Right after, right after June 22nd, you're going to see an increased temperature. Then it says, a light, a light, a light, a light, meaning you're looking at the moon. It's a full light. Thank you for the gift. Much appreciate you. A light that decreases in her perfection, meaning the full moon is a full light and it starts to decrease from being perfectly full to being less full. This is going into waning gibbous, this is going into crescent moon, this is going into waxing gibbous, all of these things, right? Verse eight, the month is called after her name. Meaning what? The month is called after the moon. The reason why you have the term month is after the term moon. You see how the Bible is so easy to understand? Then it says, increasing wonderfully in her changing, being an instrument of the armies above, shining, shining, shining in the firmaments of heaven, shining in the sky. 
All right, next question. Can you explain how to spell evert, a.k.a. Hebrew? I haven't read this word anywhere online. You mean eve? You mean eber? E-B-E-R? We, we just read it earlier in, in uh, E-B-E-R is where we get the word Hebrew. Eber is where we get the word Hebrew. So you read about Eber in Genesis chapter 10, verse 21. Let's read it. Genesis 10, 21, it says, Unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, all the children of Eber, E-B-E-R, this is where we get the term Hebrew, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. Watch this. Verse 24, Genesis chapter 10, verse 24. Genesis chapter 10, verse 24. It says, And Arphaxad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber, E-B-E-R. This is where we get the word Hebrew. Hebrew comes from Eber. Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. And unto Eber were born two sons, the name of the one Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. So the Tower of Babel, that happened during the time of Peleg. Okay? So now, now the term Hebrew, the term Hebrew itself, H E B R. E-W is not talking about he brewed some coffee. The first mention is from our father, Abram, before his name was changed to Abraham. People don't even put two and two together. His first name was Abram. And once he traveled to Africa, his name was Abraham. Reason would believe that Abraham was a black person, but people lose that thought. They say Hamites. Oh, only the Hamites. No, this is a Shemite. Abraham. Ham, but nobody put two and two together. Let's read it. Genesis chapter 14, verse 13 gives us the first mention of Hebrew or Eber. It says, and there came out one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew and told Abram the Hebrew. That's the first mention of Hebrew in the Bible. Genesis 14, verse 13. Make sure you write that down. Genesis 14, verse 13, is the first mention of Abram, a.k.a. Abraham, being a Hebrew. Prior to that, it is not used in the Bible. They were called Eberites or Ebri, but it was Hebrew at Genesis chapter 14. All right. I hope it makes sense. All right. Hope it makes sense. The next mention, the, the term Hebrew itself is mentioned 53 so times in the Bible, 53 times. In the Apocrypha, it's mentioned seven times. In the hidden writings, such as Jasher, Jubilees, and Enoch, it's it's uh, about 70 times, okay? So Old Testament, 32. New Testament, 14. Apocrypha, seven times, you see the term Hebrew, all right? All right. Any other uh, questions? Uh, you are almost there. Send a message to invite gifters to come back. Live goal achieve. Oh, thank you. All praise to the most high. Thank you for helping us to reach our live goal. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for the let him cook. All right. So like I said, we'll try our best to answer questions based on scriptures. Notice I didn't give nobody my own words. We always went to book, chapter, verse. If I don't know an answer, I'm not a prideful person. I'm going to say, I don't know if I don't know. Like If you ask me something like, how tall is the 144,000? I'm going to say, I don't know. If you ask me something like, when it says Jesus was real taller than all the rest, how tall is he going to be? How tall was Adam? Did they wear sandals in the garden of Eden? I don't know those type of questions, okay? When the, when the angel was carrying the flaming sword, what kind of sword was it? Was it a broad sword? Was it a katana? Was it, a, was it, was it ninja? I don't know those kind of answers, y'all. And I'm not going to be prideful to try to answer it. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I wish I did. I wish the most I gave me. Oh, you know what? That reminds me. I'm always about to end alive and then something just pops into my head. Y'all be real careful and mindful of your dreams. 
Dreams can have impact on your spirit. If you dream something that's evil, make sure you pray and ask God to take away that evil spirit from you. Because just like God can give you dreams, guess what? Satan can also give you dreams, y'all. If you're having dreams of inappropriate things, make sure you pray about it and ask God to take it away from you. If you're having dreams that are strange and unexplainable and you know it's ungodly, make sure you're praying and asking God to take those evil spirits away from you because dreams lift up fools. You have some people that say, oh, I had a dream that little black boys and little black girls and little white boys and little white girls can hold hands together. Y'all see that dream, that 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 so-called uh, Martin Luther King dream was all BS. You see that, right? You see that. So sometimes there are spiritual forces that try to manipulate you in your sleep. Make sure you fight against it. Make sure you're constantly reading your Bible, constantly praying, constantly asking God for divine protection over you, your family, your children, your cousins, your fa everybody that you encounter ask for spiritual protection because we're living in times where there's a lot of negative things. But y'all, people are seeing demons out here, y'all. People are seeing weird stuff. Yeah, I heard about the story about what, what happened in um, Miami. Yeah, I heard about what happened in Miami. I heard how they people have been speculating about CERN and all of this stuff and portals opening up in the sky. People are seeing strange anomalies. Yeah, I heard about what happened with military installations of the United States having strange entities, apparitions floating above it. So now the next question is this. If you have heard about it, does the Bible talk about apparitions? Hmm. Does the Bible talk about apparitions? I wonder. You see, everything we talk about, we can parallel it to the Bible, y'all. Watch this. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 17, verse 3. For while they supposed to lie hid in their secret sins, they were scattered under a dark veil of forgetfulness, being horribly astonished and troubled with strange apparitions. Meaning what? The things they're seeing in Americans' military installations where interdimensional beings are floating over their military bases, they're shooting off rockets, and these entities are turning off their rockets. Some of, their, some of them are angels, and some of them are strange apparitions. Strange apparitions, strange apparitions, okay? Wisdom of Solomon chapter 17, verse 15. It says, we're partly vexed with monstrous apparitions, meaning what? The plague of darkness that hid over Egypt during the time of Moses. I remember that time where it was three days of darkness. People were seeing stuff. It was so dark, you couldn't even light a match and see the match. It was so dark when people tried to light a torch, you couldn't see the torch light. That's how dark it was, y'all. Same weird stuff like that is happening in 2024. I got a video on my page right now where it was a thunderstorm in Houston, Texas. And when that thunderstorm transpired, guess what? It went from day to night in a matter of instant. And this was a month after the eclipse. So nobody could say, oh, it was, a, it was around the eclipse. The eclipse was in what month? It was in April. The darkness during that thunderstorm and tornado in Houston was in May, a month after the eclipse. So, yeah, people are seeing strange things, y'all. Stay prayed up. Read your Bible. Play the book of Psalms before you go to sleep. Pray the book of Proverbs. Get some wisdom. OK, get some wisdom from there. Let's go to Second Maccabees, chapter three, verse twenty eight. Now, as he was there present himself with his guard about the treasury, the Lord of spirits going into Christ in the Apocrypha and the prince of all power caused a great apparition so that all that presumed to come in with him were astonished at the power of God and fainted and were sore afraid. Sometimes you can ask God, hey, I want you to send strange apparitions to Esau, Edom, Moab, Ishmael, all these nations that dealt wrong with us. And God is going to do it. That's what you see going on right now. Military installations are seeing strange things. There's a news story right now 
that was about maybe two or three months ago where there was an anomalous thing that they call the UFO jellyfish, okay? The UFO jellyfish was an interdimensional entity with jellyfish-like legs floating across a military installation, phasing in and out materially, phasing, they could only see it through, I think it was infrared satellite or infrared camera or night vision. They could not see it in physical form. And it was flying straight across a military installation, flew all the way to the ocean, went under the water for like 17 to 20 minutes, and then zip flew up into the air and disappeared. They could not even catch it. So imagine something that can breathe underwater for 20 minutes and transition from light to dark to heat to land to water to air to space. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. That's what's going on in 2024. But people want to be an atheist and don't want to read the Bible. <laughs> Good luck with that on Judgment Day. All right, y'all. All right, this 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 is the last go now. I said, I said, I'm going to get offline and I stayed on for another hour. So I appreciate you all. <laughs> We're going to join on again tomorrow for another discussion. Thank you for joining the Forefront Radio. With that, we say peace to the 12 tribes of Israel. Shalom to you all.